Movies allow us to bring the fantastic to life. With modern technology, anything we can dream can end up on the screen. But how do filmmakers decide what something should look like when there's no tangible source for it in reality? Well, if they're lucky, some artist has already created the imagery they want for their film. Taking inspiration, or just plain taking, they recreate those images using movie magic. Today, I want to talk about one of the earliest films to push the boundaries of special effects, and the artist whose work gave the filmmakers the blueprint to create a whole world. Or perhaps I should say an underworld. This is 100 Year Old Movies. L'Inferno is a 1911 Italian film adaptation of the first part or cantile of Dante Alighieri's epic narrative poem, The Divine Comedy. It's often referred to simply as Dante's Inferno. The film has three credited directors. The first two, Francesco Bertolini and Adolfo Padovan, are credited as artistic directors, while the third, Giuseppe Di Laguaro, is credited as a technical director. Of the three, Giuseppe Di Laguaro seems to be the professional filmmaker, with 91 credits on IMDb, compared to the handful of works by Bertolini and Padovan. There was next to no information on these men that I was able to find. Di Laguaro, it's safe to say, was a pioneer Italian film director. His two sons also worked in the film industry. I found one source saying that Padovan was a literary and philosophy scholar, and nothing on Bertolini. What I think, and this is speculation on my part, is that Bertolini and Padovan had other careers, and their reasons for making this had everything to do with adapting classic literature and little or nothing to do with becoming filmmakers. When it comes to special effects, the best part of the movie, I believe that's all the work of Di Laguaro. The film was produced by Milano Films and became an international success. In the United States alone, it grossed over $2 million, which would be something over $64 million today. It tells the story of Dante, who is led by the poet Virgil through the nine circles of hell and shown how the various damned are eternally punished for their sins. He sees the unbaptized in limbo, who just sort of hang around in a field with nothing to do. He meets an adulterous couple who gave in to lust. Here the sinners are tossed about endlessly in a violent storm for their lack of self-control. He must pass the dreaded Cerebus to find the gluttons wallowing in the mud as icy rain pours down on them. He watches as the greedy must constantly push giant bags of gold. He crosses the Stygian swamp where the wrathful and the sloths wade and flail at each other. At the center of this swamp is the city of Dis where he's threatened by three furies. He descends from there to find heretics laying in tombs of fire. He hears the cries of suicides who've been transformed into gnarled trees which bleed as they're pecked at by harpies. He looks down on the blasphemers who lay on hot sand as fire rains down on them. He rides the monster Geryon down to the next circle, where panderers and seducers are whipped by demons and flatterers bathe in a river of filth. Simoniacs, who bartered in religious offices and sold the blessings of God for their own profit, are here buried head first in the ground and have their feet burned. Corrupt politicians are tossed into boiling pitch. Hypocrites wear cloaks of lead. Thieves wrestle with serpents. Grifters are turned into lizards. The sores of discord are mutilated and dismembered. Finally, Dante reaches the ninth and lowest circle of hell, where traitors are frozen in ice. The devil himself is imprisoned here, a three-headed bat-winged giant eternally chewing on the bodies of the world's worst traitors. With this, their journey is complete, and Dante and Virgil leave behind the horrors of hell. The imagery in the film is incredible. It's a credit to the filmmakers that they created such elaborate, detailed, and large-scale scenes. They showed remarkable ambition and ingenuity in putting together sets, makeup, 
costumes, and a constant barrage of visual effects. Their efforts weren't just to show off what tricks they could put on screen, either. They were dedicated to recreate on film the fantastic wooden engraved illustrations by Gustave Doré. Doré published his illustrated edition of Dante's Inferno in 1861, containing 75 woodcut prints. A prolific French artist who worked professionally from the age of 15 right up to his sudden death from illness in 1883 at the age of 51. He's best remembered for the illustrations he made for books. Along with Dante's The Divine Comedy, he did illustrations for Cervantes' Don Quixote, Coleridge's The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, Milton's Paradise Lost, Tennyson's Idols of the King, Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, and many more, including 241 engravings for the Bible. Publications of these works are still in print today, either with the original text they were created for, or collected on their own. Let's look at the scenes from the film, alongside the art that inspired the filmmakers, and see how they did. In this picture, Sharon arrives to ferry the souls across the Acheron River. His posture suggests weariness from a difficult task, emphasized by the choppy waves splashing against the boat. The angle of his body how he holds the oar, and the boat stretching behind him form a triangle in the center of the picture. The film puts Dante and Virgil in the foreground, watching him row to the shore where all the souls await his arrival. The boat itself is an exact match to the illustration. In this picture, the giant figure of Minos, with his crown and serpent's tail wrapped around him, passes judgment on the sinners, assigning them to the section of hell which fits their misdeeds. His muscular body dominates the image. His pose is relaxed and confident, while those he judges are small, their poses suggesting shame and anguish. A winged demon stands guard, perhaps indifferent, even bored, by the proceedings. The film uses a classic photography trick to make Minos a giant. It's the same forced perspective technique used in Lord of the Rings and Elf. The demon guard and Minos seem to be more interactive in the film, and the judged tremble comically. The next picture shows the carnal sinners tossed about in a storm. It's an eerie image which makes the bodies flying across the sky look like a massive swarm of insects. The film achieves this with what looks like a multi-layered matte shot combining several elements in the frame at once. No doubt they were inspired by the experimental work of George Méliès. This is incredibly ambitious, and among the most impressive special effects in the film. Cerebus guarding the gluttons is recreated for the film using a puppet, which is an excellent match to the original art. While the illustration of Dante and Virgil walking among the bodies of gluttons is eerie, I think the film depiction is far more horrific. The writhing mass of so many bodies in the rain suggests worms slithering over each other in the mud. It's all the more unnerving that real people are performing this. The greedy pushing their giant bags of gold reminds the viewer of the Greek myth of Sisyphus, rolling his boulder up a hill just to have it fall back over and over again for eternity. The film captures the futility of their efforts, but their attitude is more of an insane compulsive frenzy compared to the picture's suggestion of a slow and painful struggle without end. In what, to me, is one of the most disturbing pictures, Dante and Virgil take a boat over swampy water in which the sloths and wrathful are submerged. The idea of pushing a boat over water filled with human bodies is apocalyptic. The zombie novel World War Z by Max Brooks describes a scene like this. The film is just as bleak, with the ferryman poking at the bodies with his oar, the image of the heretics in their fiery tombs is strikingly gothic. The lighting effect here is excellent. The corpse, which looks sculpted from stone, standing bolt upright in his pit, lit from below and casting a long tombstone-like shadow behind him. In both the film and the illustrations, the pits appear as open graves. 
The bodies pop up and grab at the characters like a Halloween funhouse. The smoke could just as easily be a spectral fog. The Suicide Forest picture is something akin to a dark version of Alice in Wonderland. The film, unfortunately, doesn't pull off the human-formed trees, but the harpies do add a bit of unsettling weirdness to the creatures inhabiting hell. Adding again to the fantastic and mythological aspects of Dante's hell is the ride on the monster Geryon. The stuffed animal with the dolls on its back in the film is... well... The Sowers of Discord is a gruesome image, prominently featuring a decapitated man holding his own head up like a hunter's trophy. While others crawl on the ground and cower in the shadows, he stands tall and in full light. This spectacle is pulled off impressively in the film, with two men against a black backdrop. One man wears a black hood that hides his head, and holds on to the head of another man wearing a black bodysuit up to his neck. One of the simpler tricks, born of stage theater, but I do enjoy it. Finally, we reach the ninth circle. Dory's illustrations are the stuff of true nightmares. A pile of icy bodies on the left, a man frozen face down on the right. In the center, Dante and Virgil inspect a man encased in ice up to his shoulders. And behind them are countless other trapped figures, stretching on forever into the darkness. The filmmakers recreate this ice garden of the damned, with heads sticking out of a frozen lake. They convincingly give the impression that it stretches on to a vast distance. Then we have Doré's Satan, an elaborate winged beast man looking angry and miserable. His massive size is shown by the detailed landscape and tiny human figures surrounding him. The film captures it perfectly. It even enhances the effect of the devil greedily chomping down on a traitorous soul. The filmmakers must have known that they couldn't take the audience all the way through hell without giving the devil a close-up. Not only another great effects shot, it's the payoff for the whole movie, and it delivers the goods. At the beginning of the video I quoted Pablo Picasso saying, Good artists copy, great artists steal. How I interpret that is to say, it's one thing for an artist to look at a landscape and copy what they see. It's another for an artist to capture in their art the essence or feeling of that landscape so well that someone who's never been there can look at it and have an emotional reaction from the artwork. Art, of course, inspires other art. Dante Alighieri's writing inspired Gustave Doré's illustrations, which inspired the makers of this film. They took what was in Dory's work and recreated the essence of it on film. Were they master artists, master thieves, or both? I'm Movie Cyclops. Thanks for watching.